so my name is Laura Schmidt Olamisi from Michigan State University, and I'm very excited to be moderating uh, this wonderful panel. Uh, I think that this panel is addressing one of the critical challenges um, of our coming century, and, and one that we have articulated as a society that we need to resolve, which is how to um, resolve the problems of human poverty uh, and development in many parts of the world with the need to uh, live within the biophysical limits uh, of the systems on which we depend. And so we're very fortunate to have three uh, speakers today who are going to address that in, in different ways and have a long uh, history of working in this area. Uh, so I'm going to introduce them. Uh, they're going to then come up and speak for about 15 to 20 minutes. And then afterwards, we should have plenty of time uh, for discussion. Uh, and the microphones are up here. Uh, people can come down and, and ask questions um, of the panel. And I think that just uh, as a little advance warning, I think that the way that we're going to do it uh, is similar to uh, what Peter Senge did the other day. And he has a lot more experience with this than I do, so I'm borrowing his technique, which is to collect a few questions, say five or six, and then have the panel uh, respond to the kind of the, the mood in the room. Um, but let me introduce our speakers uh, to begin with. Uh, so first, uh, uh, Immediately to my left, we have uh, Dr. Robin Broad from American University. Uh, she is a leading scholar and participant in the movement to create a more just and sustainable economic globalization. Uh, so she has worked in the field of uh, development and globalization um, since completing her dissertation at Princeton University in 1983. Uh, she's the author of uh, several books on uh, social movements, uh, globalization, global economic governance, uh, including a, a book that's somewhat close to my heart because I used it in my research in the Philippines uh, called Plundering Paradise. You can kind of guess from the title what, what the topic was. Uh, she's also uh, written books such as Global Backlash, Citizens and Citizen Initiatives for a Just World Economy, and Development Redefined, How the Market Met Its Match. Uh, and so her current research looks at local, national, and global linkages uh, to focus on the tension between local rootedness and global vulnerability. Uh, and she's going to share with us a couple of case studies from El Salvador and the Philippines on uh, how to redefine development. Uh, second, we have uh, Dr. Ashwini Chatre from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He's an assistant professor in the Department of Geography, and he has degrees in uh, economics and political science uh, from uh, the University of Delhi and Duke University, respectively. Uh, he spent uh, uh, more than 11 years working with local communities uh, in central India. And his research interests are broadly centered on the dynamic cross-scale interactions between democratization, economic development, and environmental governance. Uh, and he's co-authored one book and published articles in many uh, prominent journals, which you can uh, read in the program. Uh, he's also uh, been the Giorgio Ruffalo Postdoctoral Fellow in Sustainability Science at Harvard University in 2006 and 2007. And today he's going to be speaking uh, to us about three core economic concepts that we need to redefine uh, and, or rethink in order to redefine development. And uh, last but certainly not least, we have Dr. Bill Reese from the University of British Columbia. Uh, Bill has a very long history and, and, uh, and, and track record, um, which you can read more about in the program. But just briefly, I'll highlight that probably most of you know him as the co-originator of the ecological footprint concept. Um, and uh, he has won many awards for his work in, um, in uh, uh, most recently, neurobiological, cognitive, and cultural barriers to sustainability. Um, he's worked across disciplines as a member of the Global Ecological Integrity Group, a fellow of the Post Carbon Institute, a uh, founding member and past president of the Canadian Society for Ecological Economics, and founding director of the One Earth Initiative. Uh, recently, he has, in 2012, been the winner of the Boulding Prize in Ecological Economics, and, and also in 2012, winner of the Blue Planet Prize uh, jointly with Dr. Wackernagel. And uh, he'll be speaking to us today on uh, Project Survival 2100, uh, and he'll describe that project a bit more and talk about social dimensions. So again, we're very privileged to have these three uh, wonderful speakers, each giving us a different insight into um, this issue of, of development and the environment. And so we'll start off with, with Dr. Broad. Thank you very much. Uh, big microphone, lots of lights, but it's nice to see you all in the audience. So I am, I'm still Robin Broad, and I'm extremely, is this microphone working? Yeah. I'm really honored to be here on this distinguished panel. 
um, with this distinguished audience and um, at the Distinguished Society for Ecological Economics conference. I spent some time thinking about how best I could contribute to this conference main theme and perhaps it, this is a good time in the conference to remind you what the conference's main theme is. So the title of the conference, we cannot say it in unison, hopefully, but is Building Local, Scaling Global, Implementing Solutions for Sustainability. And this particular plenary, as Laura just told you, is focusing on redefining development. Um, which is actually a nice coincidence for me because, as Laura also told you, I have a book called Development Redefined. So I thought I'd just read you 300 pages from that book or something today. No, seriously though, what I decided was that rather than talk in the abstract, which I know we will do um, as the panel continues and that you and the audience are extremely capable of thinking about these things in the audience and spend a lot of time doing that. Rather than speak in the, in the abstract or summarize the book, or rather than share my experience from the two years where I worked as an international economist in the US Treasury Department when a man named Ronald Reagan was president, we can also talk, well maybe we shouldn't talk about that in questions and answers, maybe we should do that over some kind of alcoholic beverage. But rather than, than talk about that, what I want to do is actually, I want to share two case studies that I'm involved with as a, as a scholar, as a researcher, as a practitioner, and I think it's okay to say it in this audience, in, in, in this group, as an activist. Um, so what I'm going to do in the next 15 minutes or so is we're all going to travel to El Salvador and the Philippines. Um, and I'm going to jump there in a moment, but before we do that travel, this is where, right, in 10 years I'll be able to push a button, and we'll all, we'll all go there, but <laughs> we can almost do it now, right? But um, ra the, the bottom line of, just to tell you where I'm going, the bottom line of these cases is that very ordinary people in places like El Salvador and the Philippines are doing extraordinary things as individuals, as coming together in organizations, and as organizations come together and build social movements. They um, are certainly facing huge obstacles, I'm not going to romanticize this, um, but they're demonstrating the power of individuals and the organizations they create to redefine development. So I strongly believe that when we talk, when we're talking about redefining development, um, actually what we need to do is start by looking at the local levels, because at the local levels, development is being redefined. And that's scaling up to the national levels. Um, and actually showing us what real, I no longer use the term sustainable, I think, and I don't use the term resilient anyway, either. We can talk about that in questions and answers. But, but to show us what, what real economics and real development should be about. So I, I'm, we're gonna, I'm gonna move to El Salvador momentarily, but, but for this audience, what I would argue is that we're seeing ecological economics in, in action by people who don't know that term necessarily, but they're showing us what it's all about. They're redefining development at a local level, somewhat at a national level, but it's when we move to the global level well, that, as you'll see from my case studies, is where the obstacles, the challenges, in my mind, really come in, and where we, at least some of us in this room, need to be focusing more of our energies. Okay, so, traveling to the El Salvador, and I have, I have a very brief period of time, so I'm gonna go through this quickly, just giving you the contours, anyone who's interested in more details, of course I'd like nothing better. I actually would prefer to talk about El Salvador than the Treasury Department. Um, so, okay, so what I want to do, it's artificial, but what I want to do in order to, to just give you the contours is go from the local level to the national level to the global level in each of these two case studies. So first of all, at El Salvador on the, the local level. Well, El Salvador is a case study of gold mining. Actually, it's a case study of, of people who have come together to try to make El Salvador the first country to ban gold mining. 
And if they were in the audience right now, they would probably be standing up in protest because they would say, Robin, you're presenting us as we don't want to be presenting. presenting. We're not against gold mining. We're for water and we're for life. And that's how they present it. So this is the, so in, again, now moving, moving to the local level in El Salvador. So in northern El Salvador, we're gonna do mental mouthing here. But in northern El Salvador, and going into Guatemala and Honduras, is a very rich vein of gold. Um, not rich enough so it was of interest to gold, to gold mining companies until very recently, but in the last 10 to 15 years as the price of gold has gone up, so I just lied, we're starting on a global level and then we're going to a local level in a moment. So the price of gold, as you guys probably know, um, has gone up a lot in the last decade or, or more. As the price of gold has gone up, um, mining companies, especially, and this is where mining companies are headquarters, especially from Canada and the U.S. and some from Australia, have become very, very interested in this vein of gold in northern El Salvador. They've gotten licenses to explore with the hope of getting licenses to exploit. That's how mining licenses work. First you explore, and then if you find enough gold, you then expect to get an actual mining license. So on one hand, we have gold mining companies very interested in northern El Salvador. On the other hand, beginning in, a, in about 10 years ago, people in northern El Salvador, and for those of you who know El Salvador, most of my field work has been done in a province called Cabanas. For those of you who don't know El Salvador, most of my field work has been done in northern El Salvador. <laughs> uh, that people in, in Caba Cabanas is a really, really poor province in El Salvador. And People's initial reaction to gold mining companies coming in was, wow, this is great. We're going to get jobs, we're going to grow, we're going to develop, we're going to become modern. And then some people started, it's very close to the, the border of Honduras. So some people actually went, some people, ordinary people, farmers, went over the border to Honduras and looked at the gold mining that was happening there. And what they found was that the water was being destroyed, that people weren't getting jobs, and that there was conflict. And they came back to Cabanas and formed organizations with the goal of keeping gold mining up. Their goal, again, their goal was to continue to be small-scale agriculturalists peasants, we're now allowed to use the word peasants again, peasants, um, growing beans and corn and vegetables and those kinds of things. And again, their, their concern was, was, it was partially ecological, it was partially, well, it began with the concern about the watershed. It's actually an already extremely degraded watershed. But it was also economic understanding that the limited jobs that were going to come would be there for only a short period of time. And it was also social, as they became more convinced that gold mining was not good for El Salvador, conflict um, erupted, and since 2009, about once a year, one of these activists has been assassinated. Um, and that's actually what got me interested in El Salvador, or interested in and doing work there. Okay, local level. Now we move up to a national level. I've just described Cabanas, but what was happening in Cabanas was happening in different areas of El Salvador. Mining companies wanted to get in, local people were, were looking into what mining was all about. And they came together, these individuals came together in groups on the local level, which then came together on a national level to form something called La Mesa, the National Roundtable Against Metallic Mining. Um, again, so the National Roundtable against metallic mining but it, um, came together, spent a, a lot of time deciding what their goal would be and decided that their goal was to ban metallic mining, ban gold mining and silver mining in El Salvador. Again, they presented very clear to present it as pro-water, pro-life rather than anti-mining. The good news is this coming together of La Mesa um, coincided with the election of a, oh, this is an academic 
audience so I can use highly theoretical terms like good, the, coming, the election of a good government in El Salvador in 2009, some 20 years after the Civil War, and I'm assuming some of you remember back to the Civil War in El Salvador, about 20 years after the, the Civil War ended, um, 20 years after the peace accord, the FMLN, who were the guerrillas, their, their political party won the presidential election and a man named Mauricio Funes was elected. Funes, as part of his campaign promises, said that if I'm elected, there will be no new mining licenses, no new exploitation licenses in El Salvador. <clears throat> Funes's term ends in 2014, and there have been no new mining licenses in El Salvador. And like some politicians we know, he actually kept his promise. <laughs> okay, so that, that sounds pretty, well, it's, um, I was going to say that sounds pretty good so far. It doesn't sound pretty good to have people assassinated, but what's happening on a local level and on a national level sounds positive. If we move up to a global, when we move up to a global level, the venue changes to Washington D.C., near where I live, and to the World Bank. Now, I bet everyone in this audience has heard of the World Bank. Some of you have probably ha may have heard of, connected to the World Bank is an investor rights tribunal. It's called the International ICSID, International Center for the Settlement of Investor Disputes. When, when foreign direct investors sign contracts with governments under different investment laws and under free trade agreements, it is now, it is now the regular fashion that there is something called an investor rights clause that, that's signed. In this case, what it means is that gold corporations, two particular gold mining companies, we might as well say their names so they become bad words, right? Pacific Rim, which is a Canadian company, and Commerce Group, which is a US company, they have sued the government of El Salvador in ICSID, in this investor rights course, court, saying that under global economic governments, and in particular under investor rights clauses, governments like El Salvador do not have the right to take an action like banning mining. The governments do not have a right to take into account environmental considerations when and not give out mining licenses. These cases are going on right now. Um, I'd like to be more optimistic about the outcome than I am. We can talk about that more in questions and answers. I want to move on to the Philippines. But basically, I should say one more thing. As, as Just like civil society in El Salvador moved up from a local level to a national level, civil society, organized civil society has also moved up to an, a global level. So groups of organizations from Oxfam to the Institute for Policy Studies to the Center for International Environmental Law, which is a group of lawyers to individuals like me. Um, um, students as well as professors have come together and formed a very loose coalition. I mean, in North America, we seem to deal with loose coalitions better than tight coalitions, but a loose coalition called International Allies. So we're International Allies of La Mesa, Trying to, trying to open the space for El Salvador and its people to decide whether or not they want mining in there. Um, but as far as the tribunal is concerned, as far as, the, as ICSID is concerned, we have no legal standing. The environment in El Salvador has no legal standing. The people on the ground in Cabanas has no legal standing. It's a, it's a, um, the debate is a very narrow debate about whether or not when these companies got exploration licenses that automatically brings them the right to get exploitation licenses. And it's, it's a debate that will be decided, it's a case that will be decided by three tribunalists. Moving on now to, the, so that's my pro-water anti-mining case. Moving to the, the Philippines more briefly, what I want to talk about is uh, a similar local, national, global level, but focusing on rice farming in the Philippines. Um, 
I'm starting with the, the local level, I spent some time I've spent some time in the last few years living with two communities of rice farmers in, in the southern Philippines, in an area where I lived, I mean, want to think about how many decades ago, but where I lived in the late 1970s and early 1980s. And in the period I lived with them, in the, I lived there in the 1970s and 1980s, um, these communities were, were being pushed to change to chemical intensive agriculture, to become modern. In, I, the reason I went back and stayed there again was, was in part because these two communities that, where I stayed are actually rejecting chemical intensive agriculture now and turning to what we would call agroecology or biodynamic or organic agriculture. Um, in t part of why I went there was to see why they were switching. I'm not going to... You want to know that? Read my Journal of Peasant Studies article. Isn't that what professors are always supposed to say, right? But um, but 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 bottom line, they're actually they're switching um, because it turns out that they actually have a very clear sense of a goal of food sovereignty, not food security. A very clear sense of food sovereignty, and they have a very clear sense of. Uh, it's kind of like James Scott's moral economy of the peasant. They have a very clear sense of the ecological economics of a peasant, and their economics is both economics the way it should be calculated. I, have to, I can say that with this audience, right? But um, so it internalizes not just risk but vulnerability. It looks not just at actual yields but looks at net costs, vulnerability to things like debt owed to to someone else, um, it includes health concerns. We think of organic, many of us think of organic agriculture as being health concerns for the consumers. For them, it's health concerns for the growers and for the consumers who happen to be themselves and their families. Um, and it's also environmental concerns. Now again, if you ask these people if they care about climate change in an abstract way, you, they probably wouldn't react to that, or they probably they might even say no. But when they talk about why they're doing what they're doing, why they're switching, they have a very concrete sense of, of the local impacts, both of locally driven natural resource degradation and also of climate change driven natural resource degradation. Okay, so that's my good news on the local level. National level, again, to use this highly theoretical framework I've developed, national level, we have a good government that comes into, that's elected in 2010, the um, government of Benigno Aquino, who many of us know as Cory Aquino's son. Um, but um, he, not a perfect government by any means, but he names as Minister of Agriculture someone who actually has a long involvement in organic agriculture and is a proponent not only of organic agriculture, but is a proponent of what we would call food sovereignty. So the Minister of Agriculture actually wants the rice, the grain that's consumed in the Philippines to be grown in the Philippines, rather than cheap white rice to be imported. Up to a global level. You guys have already probably caught what's gonna happen when we get to a global level, right? Get to a global level, the venue changes. We're in Geneva and the World Trade Organization. And it turns out that the Philippine government does not have the right to decide its own food import or export policy. The Philippines has to negotiate this. It has to negotiate it, its trade, and in this case, its rice trade, with the WTO. And it has to get permission of other WTO members, like Thailand, which is very interesting in importing rice to the Philippines. It has to get permission for any kind of quote unquote protectionist policies it wants to put in place, any kind of food sovereignty policies, it has to get permission to the WT, from the WTO, which is needless to say a very challenging task. And so right now the Philippines is entering a very complicated agreement that is forcing it to actually import rice and the economic ministries in the Philippines have decided that the only way they're going to deal with that is by exporting rice of a similar value to make up for the foreign exchange costs. Okay, quick reflections, and then we can reflect more um, later. Quick reflections to, 
to me, moving back from my case studies, actually I find that case studies on the local and national level extremely optimistic, and it's not just because I'm an optimist, I actually think I'm a pessimist, but I find them extremely optimistic. Um, yes, there's challenges, yes, not everyone in either government thinks this is a wonderful thing, not everyone on the local level in Cabanas is against mining, but overall, um, actually polls have shown that almost 70% of the Salvadoran population doesn't want mining in El Salvador. Um, but from my case studies, where I'm really stunned, where, where I think the challenges are, is the global level. Now, some of us have been talking for many years about the death of the Washington Consensus, the death of neoliberalism. In 1999, I wrote that the Washington Consensus was cracked. If it was cracked in 1999, it should be dead by now. Um, at least in my theory of how you move from being cracked to being dead. Um, yes, at a global level, we have more paradigms and contention than we had 20 years ago. There's more of a debate. There's voices from people like um, Olivier de Schutter, the UN Special Rapporteur for Human Rights, the UN Special Rapporteur for, and also the UN Special Rapporteur for, for Water. But um, it's, it, um, we actually need, those of us who want there to be a different economics, a different, a different shaping of how the world works, we actually, we need El Salvador to ban mining. And we need the Philippines to move towards food sovereignty. Those have implications not only for those countries, but far beyond those countries, in terms of positive ways forward. And what they, what they need is really for us to figure out how to open, open space at the global level, to change the space because it's still dominated by mainstream economics that does not reflect what's happening on a local level. Thank you very much. That is a tough act to follow. <laughs> That's competition, right? Yeah, it's collaboration. Actually, we blend nicely together. I hope so. I must humbly admit that uh, for all the efforts at uh, redefining development over the last, I would go so far as to say 30 years, have uh, spectacularly crashed and burned, and that juggernaut goes on unimpeded. I have a humble suggestion that instead of trying to redefine development, we try to redefine growth, to mean more than just economic growth. That is. Uh, something that has held itself together is considered to be sacrosanct. It's actually gaining power as a snowball rolling down a steep slope. But there are other ways to think about getting out of the way of that snowball. I would like to build on what uh, uh, Julie started yesterday and uh, uh, Robin has continued. Stories of good outcomes. And what I want to tell you is, uh, of course, I will illustrate it with uh, a few examples of real people and real places, but what I want to do is try to give you some pause to consider the core concepts that prevent us from seeing these good outcomes for what they are, instead of just exceptions relegated to the back pages of the New York Times. Uh, a couple of caveats. I am not an environmentalist. I have been accused of being one, but I have always denied it. <laughs> I am also not a religious person, so I do not intend to save anything. Not the world, not its people, not the planet, not anything. I want to stand by the people who want to do a couple of things that I have kept in front of me as the outcomes that drive my choice of actions, both in terms of research and collaborations with either other researchers or activists. One is human well-being. I seek to increase human welfare without compromising the social and biophysical support systems that sustain human health welfare, now and in the future. And intertwined with that outcome, is my desire to increase democratic authority, which is increasing the accountability of public authorities to those who are affected by their decisions. And uh, 
I would like to emphasize, I said public authorities, not all authorities. There are many other kinds of authorities, but I intend to focus on public authorities. But we can come back to all of this later. What I want to do is talk about three concepts, and there are many more that need to be challenged, or at least that we need to pause and rethink. And uh, uh, you may disagree with what I am about to say. That would not be unusual at all. I have been wrong several times before. What I do hope, however, is that it gives you pause and helps you rethink some of the actions that we do in our research, in our observations, and then, of course, in our inferences based on our data and observations and research and analysis. It helps us rethink some of the ways in which we see the world. All three of these concepts that I will talk about today involve a redefinition of the idea of growth with a focus on economic growth. All of these three are heavily intertwined, so their separation is more an analytical strategy than a statement on their empirical status. It is just a heuristic to help us think about rethinking growth. The first is the idea of discount rate as a predictor of the future. And uh, I have found people doing this uncritically, economists and non-economists alike, without thinking. And when I push them, when I push myself initially and I was surprised by the result and when I push other people, it turns out it's a rather bizarre concept. It's quite counterintuitive and definitely full of contradictions because it assumes at its very basic, fundamental, foundational, conceptual level that the future is worse than the present. And that is not what most people believe. That is not how most people act in this world. Everyone believes, at least most of the people I know and hang out with believe, that the future is better than the present. But our discount rate forces us to think of the future as worse than the present. Because a dollar today is worth more to me than a dollar tomorrow. When you think about it, a dollar tomorrow may be less valuable to me than a dollar today. I will grant you that. Sometimes that is indeed the case. But a tree that I planted today will be more valuable to me tomorrow, just purely on the basis of economic benefits. My daughter today will be more valuable to me tomorrow, and definitely not less, at least I hope so. There are many things many decisions, many allocations of resources that we do, that we undertake as individuals, as groups, as entities that allocate resources, that do not treat the future as worse than today. But we use the discount rate as a foundational principle and plug it into our models uncritically. The drive, the desire, the mechanism that allows us to do this uncritically is that we have fallen into the trap of converting everything to dollars. And it is very easy to discount the future when we convert all of it into dollars. Again, just a pause, think about it. If I had X amounts of dollars and I invested it, why else would it do it except in the belief that the future will be better than the present? So we need to rethink how to predict the future. And discount rate is good for many purposes, but it has outgrown its utility and it's preventing us from seeing the future as we actually would like to see it and often unthinking, unthinkingly believe it to be better than the present. The second concept, another sacred cow, price as an indicator of scarcity. I'm still developing this idea, but it comes up repeatedly. And I see the idea of price as an indicator of scarcity frames issues that lend themselves to a narrowing of the focus and, of course, undesirable outcomes that we then club into externalities and try to deal with it separately. But if we broaden the focus away from, from scarcity to security, to sovereignty, to other ways of thinking about outcomes, 
then we would want different indicators. Price is not a good indicator of anything else. And it is also not a good indicator of scarcity for everything at all times. I will give you one example. I have several others anecdotal instances. In one example, there is, of course, the need for energy. There is a village, and I mean, this is a real example. There is a village that uh, has water, but it needs to be pumped up over to where the, the fields are. And you need energy to pump that water. You have the choice of using a diesel pump, but diesel costs money. Alternately, the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research in India, the primary body that uh, deals with basic science, its regulation, funding, etc., commissioned a study several years ago that published uh, several volumes called The Wealth of India that documented the wealth of India. One of the volumes has listed 94 species of trees that grow wild. The oil of the seeds of these trees can be used with very minimal pre-processing as a substitute for diesel. This was done 30 years ago. We, of course, now know it. We can use soybeans to produce diesel. We can do many things. We can even derive energy from miscanthus. But these oils have been around for a long time. Whales are nearly extinct because we hunted them out for their oil. And this oil is growing all around us. There are these two trees, Pungamia and Neem. Both of them have cultural value, they have medicinal value, they grow wild, people also plant them in their backyards, on the buns of their trees. They use them for multiple purposes, but uh, oil is usually not one of them. Their oil is very expensive. So what this village decides to do is use a local exp expeller that is usually expelling oil from cotton seed to extract oil from seeds that have fallen down on the ground from all these trees that are growing wild on the landscape, both on private lands and common lands, take the oil out and use it to power the pump to draw water from the river to irrigate their fields. And an economist comes along, a regular economist, not the kind who would be sitting in this room, comes along and says, this is nonsensical because neem oil is selling in the market for 160 rupees a liter and diesel is selling for 55 rupees a liter. Why would you not buy diesel in the market and sell neem oil on the market? And the people think about it. It's not that they are unaware of the price of the neem oil or of diesel, but they think hard and they decide that overall, on balance, they are much better off for various reasons because this price as an indicator of the scarcity of neem oil is not only beyond their control, it does not include all the benefits that they get from many other things because now some of these farmers are also using the neem oil, a combination of neem and pungamia oil uh, in their tractors and the fumes from burning this oil drives away mosquitoes. They are also using the oil seed the seed cakes to feed their cows and the milk yield has doubled in five years. There are many other benefits for which they no longer need to spend money in order to meet their needs. But the 160 rupees a liter for the neem oil is a very poor indicator of the scarcity of all these other things that growing neem trees and extracting oil from the seeds of these trees will provide this community. We could think of it as security, we could think of it as sovereignty, we could think of it as reducing vulnerability. There are many other lenses that people have already suggested that are, I think, equally useful, but price is not one of them. We need to step back and think. That does not mean that we should not price things. It does mean that we need to be critical in deploying it in making decisions about what to do and what not to do. The third, productivity, is an indicator of progress. As a metric for comparing benefits, completely useless. Again, pause. 
Think about it. Think about agriculture. I work in well, different contexts, but uh, a lot of uh, my work is in rain fed areas, working with farmers who depend on the rain. Yield per hectare is quite a useless metric because the total amount of land is constant in the short term. What you want is to measure productivity by what we value. If water is valued, then we should measure yield per liter of water because we don't have enough of it. We want more of it. If nutrition is valued, that should be the denominator, not hectares. And if we change the denominator, we see very different results from the same process. What is the productivity in terms of child nutrition, of a particular agricultural practice? That is a very different lens. It's a different question to ask, and it result, it, it leads to very different answers. Answers that I like, and uh, I'm saying this here because I suspect all of us in this room will like the kinds of answers that we will get if we ask these kind of questions. An example of how to think about this and its implications and the cascades that uh, uh, ripple, out, ripple out of this kind of twisted thinking, if I may, is a small experiment that has been running in one part of uh, West Central India on uh, protective irrigation and food security. Now we assume, and I don't know where it came from, and I again invoked Julie yesterday, these are one of those natural laws that coffee comes before cat food, <laughs> is that once you have irrigation, mass irrigation, once you construct a large reservoir for irrigation, then in the command area, everyone gets as much water as they can, and everyone downstream gets as much water as they can after you have had your fill. And this is the law of nature because that is how it has always been done. Now, two villages in South Central India decided that that is just plain stupid. What we really need really, really need for our crops is three guaranteed protective irrigation. Three times 50 millimeters of irrigation. We may not need it, but when we need it, we really need it very badly. Because if we don't get protective irrigation in a dry spell, in a rainfed area, especially if we get a three-week dry spell, which is not unusual, during flowering season for cereal crops, our productivity yield per hectare, or total yield, will go down by 50%. But if we have a 50 millimeter application of irrigation, during that period, our yields, total yields, will be stabilized. So what we want is not flood irrigation. What we want is not unlimited irrigation. What we want is a small bit of irrigation to stabilize our food production. And if we restrict ourselves to that, then many more people will be able to get that 150 millimeters of sheer guarantee free applications of irrigation. And they did it. And the irrigation engineers and the irrigation economists were flabbergasted. Because that's not how you do things. You put a lot of water and then of course, you put a lot of energy and you put a lot of fertilizer and you put a lot of pesticides and you produce a lot of things and then you make a lot of money. These people did not want that. They want to make money and they are making money. But they first and foremost want to stabilize their yields at a level where they will not go hungry in case the market fails them. We all appreciate these responses, these kind of results that people achieve, often achieve but definitely always desire. But we don't have the core economic concepts that can help us get from water, from irrigation, from, ir from energy, from oil, from many other things to an outcome. And we are stuck, we are trapped by these concepts that actually drive us in a different direction. These concepts privilege expertise, irrigation engineers, irrigation economists. They crowd out democratic impulses. These local communities, if they want to do their own things, 
they are not allowed to because the structures are set up to do it differently. And they always work against local synergies where people want to get their oil cake and eat it too. I'm not a romantic advocate of the local, but who are located at these higher scales? People who are omnivores, who don't care where their, whatever they consume come from. And uh, we help that consumerist pattern along, capitalism or not, by an uncritical application of these and several other similar concepts. Instead of pausing to think, whether they actually help us accomplish what we desire. All of this ultimately serves to glorify and fossilize the idea of growth as only economic growth. We can change that by using different concepts that actually reflect both of our priorities as well as the outcomes that we want to see in the world. We can redefine growth as much more than economic growth. Thank you very much. Well, good morning, everyone. Robin said a lot of nice things about being here. I won't repeat them. I'm just absolutely delighted if I told you how delighted it would take all my 20 minutes. Now, unlike my younger colleagues, um, I'm an old guy, and I need visual aids to remind me what I'm here to talk about. So I'm going to have a series of slides, and I hope I can walk you through these in, in a logical fashion. This is a huge topic. It requires insights from a number of disciplines, and I think we're trying to draw these together. Another difference between my colleagues and myself is that I'm going to be talking primarily to people who are resident in the first world, in developed countries. We've heard of some of the implications of first world development on third world countries, but I'm going to go beyond that. I've chosen this title very deliberately. I'm a population ecologist, a systems ecologist, I believe that humankind will come to live within the means of nature, whether we like it or not, one way or the other. The real choice before us is whether we can do this with any degree of social justice or equity. And so that's how I've decided to frame this topic within the, the context of, of the meeting. And the first thing we have to keep in mind that we are already in a state of global overshoot. If there's anything we've learned from our global eco-footprint analysis, it is that humans are using every major uh, ecosystem at a far greater rate than it can produce. Uh, overall, it's about 50%. It takes about a year and a half now for the natural processes on the planet to re replicate, to produce as much as humans consume in a year. So we're polluting the atmosphere. Consumption here implies both waste production, uh, the overfilling of waste sinks, as well as the drawing down of natural capital stocks, whether they be uh, forests or fish stocks or soils. We're just using them up much more rapidly than they can produce themselves. The reason is quite simple. Uh, this is a graph of just the last 2,000 years of human population growth. It, it, it's a surrogate for the state of the human enterprise because everything else has actually grown even faster than that population. What we can take from this as, again, as a population ecologist is a number of things. First of all, the normal state of humankind, we are what biologists refer to as K-strategists. We tend to press up against carrying capacity. This curve could actually be extended to the left uh, for another 200,000 years, and it would remain flat. Most 99.9% of human history has been living at carrying capacity, fluctuating above and below, crashing, coming back, and, and so on. But the point is, we are naturally pressing up against carrying capacity. What happened about 200 years ago? This discovery of how to use fossil fuel. Fossil fuel is the means by which we acquire all the other resources needed to create the modern human enterprise. Not only our own bodies, but the entire infrastructure, all our goods, toys, and artifacts of civilization. They are the products of the transformation of the natural world into material artifacts for human use using fossil fuel. And if we do not find a substitute for fossil fuel, and we are nowhere close to doing so, we are going to come down on the other side of this curve. It will crash as rapidly, perhaps, perhaps a little more slowly than it's gone up. And by the way, if we do find a substitute, that's also catastrophic because we'll simply continue to use up the rest of nature uh, the same way we did using fossil fuel. So we're really in a very uh, difficult position, having reached this point and uh, 
having to design a way to come down softly. Now, the main point, however, to take from this is that we in ecological economics and in normal economics take growth to be the normal state of human affairs. And what I'm trying to emphasize here is that is a, this recent spurt, the enormous expansion of the human enterprise, is actually the single most anomalous period in human history. No species in nature grows continuously. They all respond to the circumstances of their environments. Human ingenuity in the form of technology, and here the economists got it right, for a short period of time has massively increased the carrying capacity of the planet to sustain humans. Technology gives us access to those other resources. But now we've overshot that uh, reproductive capacity of nature using our technological assets. There's another problem. And this is, is probably the one most of you are here to think about. And that is, at the same time we've overshot nature, we've created a global socioeconomic engine which is structured in such a way as to suck wealth from the bottom, from rural areas, from poor people, and deposit them at the top of the heap. Uh, this is the most recent uh, pyramid of, of uh, the distribution of income by quintile I could find. It shows that the richest 20% of people on Earth, and we're all in this room, part of that 20%, consume about 80% of everything. We take home 76% of, of income, and private consumption, some say, is as high as 86% among this group of 20%. The poorest 20% of people on the planet get by on 1% to 2% of income, depending on whether you look at the market exchange rates or purchasing power. Parity. Well, this is an egregious maldistribution of the propensity to consume. It's intolerable in the kind of world that we're facing. So far, the only mainstream response to resolving this dilemma is the totally constructed belief that we can simply grow our way to prosperity uh, so that uh, the people at the lower end will at least get, reach sufficiency. We are not willing to talk about the share word, for example, in our, our culture. Well, I've got three premises, starting from those contextual slides, three premises. The first is that the science of global change is basically correct. If we don't start there, anyone who says science is nonsense has to really come up with an alternative description of reality. Our science is pretty damn good. The, the climate science, the soil science, the science of pollution, the eco-footprint analysts, all are saying the same thing. And there are any number of thought or think tanks that have looked at this in detail and come up with some of the conclusions up here. I don't want to read these. By the way, anybody can have this slide deck who wants to request it from the organization. I'll leave it on the computer here. The second premise is that if the science is correct, it follows directly that if we're ever going to be sustainable, there will have to be a significant reduction in material and energy throughput, accompanied by great, greater social equity. That, that at least would be the goal. Now, we've talked a little bit here, not nearly enough, about the steady state economy. One of the roots of, 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 of ecological economics, uh, Brian Check was here with his book. Listen, if we don't reach a steady state, then I think it's game over. Secondly, steady state in itself is not enough. It has to be a steady state at a much lower level of energy and material throughput than we are accustomed to enjoying, particularly again in the first world. The third premise then is one that is almost completely at odds with everything we've learned in North America for the last 40 or 50 years. This is a collective problem. Humanity is facing a collective dilemma. It's a dilemma of the species. It cannot be resolved by any individual nation. The United States cannot become sustainable in a world in which China and India and Europe and everywhere else is not. No individual can be sustainable in a world which is following the status quo and going down the mainstream path. That period has long passed where you can live in isolation for these global trends. Climate change will affect everyone if the science is correct. So the choices before us, it seems to me, are quite stark. We, in the human enterprise, will likely contract. We will do this because nature forces it upon us, or because we recognize this is a collective dilemma, 
We must come together as a species, as nations, and plan a way down that is satisfactory, if not ideal, uh, for everyone. So business as usual risks, I think, a chaotic explosion of, of some natural phenomena. It, it could be the climate system. And if you look at the most recent data, it, it's, it's astonishing. Five years ago, we were talking about a half meter sea level rise by the end of this century. Now it's up to two or three. That displaces tens, hundreds of millions of people from coastal cities. What are we going to do when these people start migrating over the rest of the planet? There's many, many scenarios that have been developed, developed around that kind of, of choice. On the other hand, we could have a well-planned, orderly, and cooperative descent toward socially just sustainability for all. That's within at least logical uh, uh, parameters, if not practical parameters. Now I want to take a slight sidebar to uh, tell us a little bit, at least at, 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 in my understanding of how we've reached the, this kind of crisis point. One or two of the other talks in this program have mentioned briefly something called the social construction of reality. A sociologists know a good deal about this. I'm going to just very quickly run through what I understand to be the meaning of it. All academic paradigms, every religious doctrine, uh, political ideologies, even scientific concepts are social constructs. We make them up. How many of you have heard of the concept of civil rights? Right. Civil rights don't exist in nature. They are a social construct that have been birthed in language, and as I say here, massaged into legitimacy by acceptance and dialogue, by debate, and finally agreement and practice. So the idea comes into force simply because there's a social process by, one, by which we come to agree on the validity of this concept. Neoliberal economics is a social construct. It's been massaged into use and utility and practice by agreement of our culture. Here's the kicker. Any social construct is valid only to the extent that it replicates honestly any aspect of reality with which it interacts. Now, my bottom line is, as a biologist, that the primary constructs associated with neoliberal economics are completely ignorant of the behavior and structural properties of ecosystems, and by the way, also of real social systems. So we're operating our economy from a social construct that departs so radically from reality, it cannot help but fail. Unfortunately, what science, well, fortunately, what science would do would modify the model to match the reality. What our culture has tended to do is try to force reality to fit the constraints of the model. That's why we're wrecking the planet all over the place and repeating that process in developing countries. The bottom line is that some social constructs are better than others in matching the behavior of the systems that they purport, purport to represent. And some social constructs are simply shared illusions that should be uh, long since been rejected. Now, the neoconservative right, I'm going to ask a question. How many of you have heard of the Lewis Powell memo? OK, three or four. Wait till I get to the bottom. In the past 40 years, the neoconservative right in North America, particularly in the United States, have undertaken a deliberate process to socially construct a new uh, political economic reality in the United States. If you go back that far, the marginal tax rate was 81%. Today it's what, 29 or something less than that? If you go back then, everybody was better housed and fed than they are today. And I'm not going to go through a whole description of society, but the point of the matter is, Lewis Powell saw this as a threat, saw the rise of feminism, the rise of environmentalism, uh, the rise of the civil rights movements as a threat to corporate structure. And he wrote a very powerful memo to the US Chamber of Commerce advising the corporate sector in the United States to begin to create an institutional framework to socially construct an alternative vision than that which was emerging from the left and to promote this as the only way of salvaging corporate values in America. So we have seen 
a period of time during which one of my colleagues at the University of Pittsburgh, a friend rather, has identified 700 think tanks that have emerged just in the last 40 or 50 years in support of the neoliberal economic paradigm and all of the values that go with it. And which is to say uh, the rise of corporate consumerism, anti-government, anti-community, anti-regulation, anti-intellectual, anti-science, climate denial, and all of that is part of this package of the constructed reality which has resulted in the uh, diminution of our regulatory capacity, the reduction of, or the loss of the, the progressive tax reforms that led to a more equitable society, the siphoning of vast quantities of wealth uh, to the 1% in, in the US case, and so on and so forth. So this isn't an accident. We've seen this as a deliberate process in social construction. Millions of dollars are still being spent annually to maintain this vision of the way the economy ought to work. So that ordinary people now in North America vote against their own interests. They've been so conned by the value set that has been promoted that they can't see that it's counter to their own interests. And again, I invite you just to look up Lewis Powell memo online. There's a whole literature now documenting the effect of it. And I don't want to overstate it. It's one of a package of things that have happened to move this whole process forward. So the right point is that the conservative right across the world, but particularly in North America, has been much more adept at recognizing the process by which societies can be moved along and then has the left. We've abandoned this because we're too liberal to try to coerce people into thinking what we're doing. The past two generations of Americans are the most socially engineered people on planet Earth. Another good place to get an insight into this is a little series of television programs by the BBC called The Century of the Self. You can get it on uh, topdocumentaryfilms.com or even now I think uh, well, the several sources. The Century of the Self. You can see this just laid out as wonderfully as you can imagine. Okay, so our challenge, what we're really here to talk about, the topic of this session indeed Ecological economics. Ecological economics is an alternative social construct, purposefully structured better to reflect the nature of both biophysical and social reality. That's why ecological economics emphasizes the physical, it emphasizes limits, steady state, it emphasizes equity as opposed to the growth and efficiency criteria driving uh, the mainstream. They're quite different paradigms because they're designed to do quite different things, and one is a better match for the big nature of social and biophysical reality than the other. So we need to deliberately construct a more adaptive cultural narrative, one that takes account of the scientific information about the global biophysical environment, as well as the nature of real human behavior. The economic policy emphasis has to shift from efficiency and growth, which is really getting bigger. Bad things can get bigger. It doesn't make it any better. We need to emphasize on qualitative change, the improvement of society getting better is a better way to go than simply getting bigger. But this requires a rebalancing. Julian Elson and the panel yesterday talked about the relative merits of shifting all the way or rebalancing. And it's certainly a rebalancing, away from competitive individualism, greed, short-term self-interest, all of which have been sanctified by the current paradigm uh, toward more cooperative community and an emphasis on humanity's long-term collective interests in survival. This is, as I say, a collective problem requiring collective solutions. So here are some just basic cognitive steps that we ought to be, it seems to me, promoting in, in this kind of context. Acknowledge that the progress myth and the myth of continuous economic growth are precisely that. These are social constructs that bear no, I mean, they're hazardous to health. And yet we believe so deeply in them uh, that they go forward in defiance of the data. I mean, we've got to get out of this. These are fallible social constructs that can't operate on a finite planet. We need to abandon the cult of consumerism. Since when is a person's self-worth measured by his accumulation of private capital? 
That's not why you value your friends. It may be, again, we've constructed this notion that he who has the most toys wins, but it's a kind of an empty paradigm from which to run one's life. We need to re-legitimize the idea of public planning at all levels of governance. We've made governments a pariah, and people are so cynical about government that even people in government become cynical and start acting the way the model suggests they should. So we hear about agency capture. We hear that the Food and Drug Administration is now simply a, an arm of, of Monsanto, for example, that the Environmental Protection Agency has been appropriated by the very uh, corporate entities that it's supposedly regulating. In Canada, there's no question, we know from study after study, that oil and gas and economic development policy has iter literally been dictated, almost verbatim, by the five big major oil companies operating the oil sands. So we've reached the point where the public interest has been shunted aside and replaced with the corporate interest, but the public now believe the corporate interest is their interest, when nothing could be further from the truth given the social and economic context on a global level. That's the power of paradigm to overwhelm reason. Human beings are potentially reasonable people, but we become caught up in these constructed paradigms. And if you want to read a marvelous book on the neurology of this, we literally get neural uh, circuits in our brains that replicate the belief systems that we subscribe to. The little book is called Brain and Culture. Find brain and culture, it'll uh, be an eye-opener, especially if you read it alongside the Powell memo I talked about earlier. Okay, so we need comprehensive mitigation and adaptive strategies for global change. Market alone will not solve the problem. Part of this then becomes uh, necessary to recognize, as any decent ecological economist will, that government intervention is legitimate and necessary for this gross market failure. Climate change is probably one of the grossest examples of market failure in both senses of the term and then that you can come up with. We need a strong national and international debate on ecological fiscal reforms, taxing bad things, uh, such as depletion and pollution, not good things. We need to end perverse subsidies. What could be sillier in a world which needs alternative energy than both Canada and the United States, for example, continuing to subsidize fossil fuels while starving uh, any of the alternatives that might help us to move into the transition phase? We need to tie development policy to strong sustainability, one of the most, I think, uh, important concepts to come out of ecological economics. We need a certain amount of natural capital per capita simply to live on the planet. That's what we've been trying to impress upon people with our eco-footprint model. Each North America depends on the productive or the bio capacity of about eight hectares, what's that, 20 acres of productive land and water just to maintain our lifestyle. And yet we're destroying and eroding that very productive capacity. There can be no sustainability if you're undermining the very source of your own wealth. This is capital depletion writ large. It's the uh, pretense that consumption is the same as real income. It is not. So we need to talk about strong sustainability much more vocally than we have done as a society in the past. And I'm talking now about the U.S. Society for Ecological Economics. <clears throat> this involves the implementation of cap auction and trade systems, uh, both in terms of pollution and for depletable resources. There are a number of supportive economic initiatives that need to be taken to overlie that. We need to reform our systems of national accounts. GDP now counts negatives as positives. If this building were to collapse, the hospital bills and lawsuits and repair costs would all be added as a positive account in the GDP of the United States. We need to re-regulate the corporate cell. There's another element of that, too. We need physical accounts. Most of our national accounts, even where it looks at biophysical assets, is in monetary terms. But that's ridiculous, because a fish stock will increase in value even as the stock is depleted. You have the illusion of constant stock, because the value remains the same, or the income remains the same from the exploitation of that stock, but you're depleting it. So what's really important is the maintenance of the physical stock not its economic value. So again, we need to recognize the 
separation of monetary from physical accounts as a vital plank in the maintenance of constant capital stocks as an underpinning of sustainability. We need to re-regulate the corporate sector to protect the global commons, and the last two uh, talks address this to some extent. We need to re-regulate international commerce, reconceive globalization, so-called free trade and free capital mobility. Do you know what the principal ecological impact of globalization has been to enable the wealthy, high-income countries access to the remaining pockets of natural capital all over the planet, which they can then deplete. So what trade does in an unregulated, free trading context is simply accelerate the rate at which the planet is depleted by the wealthy consumers that inhabit it, making us all worse off in the long run, while creating the illusion in the rich consuming countries that us all as well. They've long since exceeded their local or domestic carry capacities, but they don't notice because they can go overseas to appropriate the wealth of nations, the real wealth of nations is in their natural capital. So most European countries, Japan for example, not a European country but it's similar, Japan uses seven times the biophysical capacity and productivity elsewhere in the world than is bound up within its own domestic territory. We're perfectly legitimate, I'm not being critical here. That's what is allowed and encouraged by the current pattern of globalization. It's simply not extendable to everybody. For every country that's running a huge ecological deficit, a factor of seven in the case of Japan, five in the case of the Netherlands, four or five in the case of Great Britain, for example, for every country doing that, there has to be some other country with a huge surplus or the global commons, which they are exploiting to sustain those levels of productivity. Absent trade, most wealthy countries could not survive because they are at least at their current levels of consumption because they're getting much of their resources from elsewhere. So this is a plea, as some other talks here have described, for some degree of relocalization. Of respect. Another aspect of trade is that once you can get everything from somewhere else, you don't mind you know, paving over your own agricultural land, cutting down your own forests, and so on and so forth. So you reinforce the dependence you've already developed on some other country. And what we ought to be doing is learning to become more self-sufficient locally on our own biocapacity, and thereby husbanding it and, and uh, increasing that biocapacity as demands and population increases. The social policy dimension of this, these are concepts that used to be common, but are now uh, disparaged. We used to talk, and indeed effectively did with progressive taxes, uh, to limit income inequality. I think Julie mentioned yesterday that uh, corporate incomes used to be 41 times the average shop floor worker, now they're hundreds of times higher. Well, this is an absurdity in the kind of world in which we live. So it means a, re a return to more progressive taxation. Taxation, everybody today recoils at the notion of being taxed because we've been conned into thinking that taxes are universally evil. Taxes, when I was growing up, we were taught that taxes were the means by which social people pooled their resources to achieve common purposes that they couldn't achieve on their own. Now that's a very different vision of taxes than today's vision of a rapacious government stealing from your pocket and starving your children. But it's a social construct that we need to re-inculcate in people's minds. We need to rebalance the notion of private capital and public capital. If a fraction, let's say half, of all the wealth that goes into automobiles in private garages in North America were put in public transportation. You wouldn't need the automobile. The public transit system could pick you up at your home and drive you to work. The point is that, again, it's this rebalancing. We've gone, the pendulum has swung vastly too far in one direction. We need to move back. There will be massive changes in the structure of the economy. People need assistance to move through that tr transition. People who are afraid of drop job loss, who fear the loss of income, will panic. There will be riots in the streets. But there won't be riots in the streets if a bridge is built so that people are cushioned in that transition between jobs in some set industries that will collapse or, or be phased out, maybe the automobile industry, and industries that will rise to take their place. A steady state is not 
a stagnant state. It's a constantly changing state, responding to new technologies, new products, the kinds of things that we need to survive in the kind of world that we have. Well, we phase out those sorts of things that are not essential to our living. So job training, uh, job training and job replacement programs are absolutely a part of this. We need new social safety nets to enable the transition to the post-carbon economy. There will be much greater burden imposed on poor people than on rich people. We can use the tax system to relieve uh, some of that burden. We used to talk in Canada about the need for a negative income tax. If you didn't meet certain income requirements, then the tax system gave it back to you so every family could live at a basically decent standard of living, given the rising costs of fuel and all the rest of it that are likely to take place. It's time to begin that dialogue again if we really want to get through this in any degree of social equity. Part of this will involve sharing work. Now, this may not happen if, if oil and gas really disappear, or at least it becomes so expensive, the value of labor relative to the value of energy may increase, and there may be, may be far more work or, than we really want. The point of the matter is, right now, we need to talk about um, alternative ways of approaching this problem, including shorter work weeks and uh, uh, job sharing. We need to stabilize and then reduce populations. I think there's plenty of evidence, Jack down here would support this, that this planet can't support 7 billion people, even at a decent standard of living, indefinitely. Right now, the average per capita eco-footprint is about 2.5, 2.7 hectares per capita. On planet Earth today, there's 1.8 hectares of productive land and water. So even the average person today is living beyond the long-term biophysical carrying capacity of the planet. Now, all of that sounds horrific to most people. In fact, we'd be better off. Uh, again, if you doubt this, read a book called The Spirit Level to give you some indication of how far down the list of countries, the United States, for example, one of the richest countries on the planet, has slipped because of the problem of inequity. But the, the, the main point is that in almost every area, this is a, a, a graph of longevity versus income. It shows a classic diminishing returns. Uh, uh, there's a clear association and, and benefit of growing income up to about 10, 12,000 international dollars per year, and then no further gain, way out to the right-hand side. So we buy nothing by doubling and trebling our incomes beyond $12,000. And if you plot any index of human welfare in this way, you get the same curve. So an intelligent species would ask, what's the point of development beyond this level of income or consumption if we're getting nothing in terms of the performance, in terms of population health along these indicators. The same thing is true if we look at subjective indicators of well-being, felt well-being. A point is reached at which there's no further gain in happiness, if you want to put it in those terms. We've heard a little bit about Bhutan's Gross National Happy Index. People don't get happier because they get wealthier. Per capita income has never been higher than today in the United States. But happiness peaked in the 1950s. It's been a 50-year slide as incomes have increased. So what would an intelligent species do? It might decide there's an optimal economic scale that produces that level of income at which these things are maximized, beyond which growth is not only useless, it's counterproductive because it results in the depletion of the natural capital that are keeping the entire a system together. It creates the inequities that are creating such a strain in wealthy societies today. Now, this is serious stuff. Let, let's face the simple fact that a maladaptive paradigm is a collection of means, ideas that can be passed from one generation to the next, just as genes are passed from one generation to the next. But a maladaptive gene is wiped out if the environment changes in ways that make that genetic endowment inappropriate. Exactly the same thing can happen to collections of means, paradigms. Our economic paradigm will be eliminated by natural selection if we maintain the course. And it's not the first time. Whole societies have failed, oops, for their beliefs in history. 
Um, we're on a business as usual course. There have been two independent studies that show, and I'm, I'm going back to the limits to growth. Some of you are too young even to remember this classic document. But it, it was foundational to my personal understanding of the nature of reality. Limits to Growth published in 1972 made certain predictions about what would happen in this century. Everybody dismissed them as impossible, wouldn't happen, couldn't happen, they'd underestimated technology and so on and so forth. It wasn't until a couple of years ago that anybody bothered to go back and plot the subsequent 30 years of history against the predictions of limits to growth. The, the real history is of purple dots. The curves are the limits to growth base model. Notice they can so coincide pretty closely. So even with this very crude, early, but absolutely intellectually stimulating model, they got it pretty right if the real data are any representation of reality. And of course, that's what real data are. Reality is tracking the limits to growth scenario. We are headed for some kind of crisis in the middle part of this century. People are in denial about the possibility of societal collapse. You ought to read Joseph Tainter, The Collapse of Complex Societies. It's a description of 25 or so previous societies that have gone through a cycle that seems almost inevitable in human cultures because they are unaware that that cycle is taking place. We are aware of it. We have, at least theoretically, the potential to take the kind of meeting we're having here seriously. You know, we, this is not just an academic exercise. We are talking about our lives, our existence here. And we've got to start living as if we had confidence in our own results. And if we don't, then we will follow the same cycle that other cultures have done. Jared Diamond, how society, what's called collapse, how societies choose to fail or succeed. We have a choice, and it's up to us make that choice in our favor. Thank you very, very much. Wonderful. So I think that gave us all a lot of uh, food for thought. I'm going to invite our three panelists to come back down. And I think in the interest of time, I know there are lunch meetings people want to get to. Let's take one round of questions. So I'm going to ask if you have a question for any of our panelists or a comment, if you could please just stick to one question or comment. Uh, maybe make your way to the microphones. Um, I don't think we have, uh, we have people to circulate them. And then we'll just take a few questions and then let the panel respond uh, after, after several questions. Thank you. Hi, uh, Jeff Garber. And, uh, I just want to focus on, on uh, I think all three panelists said things related to international trade and commerce as a, as a huge symbol of what's wrong, an opportunity to change things. Um, I'm a member of the Joint Public Advisory Committee of the NAFTA Environment Commission. We're doing a review of the NAFTA's first 20 years. There's a call for comments. A lot of what's going on at this conference and, and you know, on Chapter 11, huge problem, uh, huge lock-in, huge NAFTA's initiated but repeatedly repeated um, uh, uh, policy tool. Uh, please participate in that call for comments and information, cec.org. Uh, JPAC, I just want to leave you with that. Thanks. Um, and I say I really enjoyed the presentations. I really strongly agree. You know, uh, I appreciate Bill, your call for like how do we change this paradigm? We got to get our views out there. We have to do it. So an example of this: 2009, a lot of environmental groups really raised record amounts of money to educate the public in global climate change. They were outspent eight to one by the fossil fuel sector, and it was a resulting plunge in the United States in the number of people who believe in global climate change or believe we should do anything about it. And what I'm wondering is what are you is that these conservatives, almost by definition, want to conserve what we have because they're the ones who have risen to the top. They're the ones who have the resources to push their their means and their views, and how do we challenge that? You know, I'm a huge advocate of uh, uh, reclaiming the airwaves and turning them back to the public sector, but the just curious if you have any response to that. I totally agree with everything I say, but... Um. Well, Josh, obviously, you're... Yeah, we're take a we're oh, oh, take a Let's just take a couple more, and then we'll respond to all the, just in the interest of time. Yeah. I, uh, I really enjoyed what was said about the discount rate, assuming that the future is worse. And I like how the concept of progress assumes that the future is or could be better. And I was just curious what the panelists think about how we value the present the implications of discount rate and progress on what we do right now. 
Um, so I was reading today that actually uh, the country of Greece was cut to emerging market status from an investment standpoint. And so there's a lot of countries now that are experiencing uh, uh, GDP stagnation and also contraction. And a lot of these were formerly developed nations. And I just wondered what your thoughts were as a panel as how these countries fit into this paradigm. So one last one, and then we'll let the panel respond. So there was mention uh, during the presentations of uh, the EPA and uh, the FDA potentially just being extensions of corporate uh, entities right now, and that that is a huge uh, barrier to the democratic process uh, working itself out. So my question is, now that we've seen a lot of other developed countries looking at revolution because of um, inactivity, or uh, misaligned activity in their governments. How do you all, what do you all see as the likelihood that our government can solve these problems uh, versus could we potentially have a revolution on our hands in the future? Thanks. That's specifically to the uh, United States. Thanks. Thank you. All right. So I'll let you guys decide who wants to take a crack at those first. So I'll just make some quick remarks and then we'll Go down the line. So I didn't catch the names of the the, the people who made comments, but um, I absolutely want to support people um, adding to the comments on NAFTA's 20 years. And beyond that, right now, um, for those of us who are actually U.S. citizens or Canadian citizens, but especially U.S. citizens, our government is negotiating something called the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP. Um, it's a secret to us. We're not allowed to see what, this is a giant free trade agreement. Um, it's got the investor rights clauses that I talked about causing problems for El Salvador. Right now the only people who can see it are the people in the US government who are working on it and the private corporations who will benefit from it. But the document is a secret to the rest of us. Um, I just saw yesterday six, um, a, a, number of, a number of junior U.S. Congress people requested that it be made public. We should all be demanding that it be made public. That's us and our future. I mean, us in the global sense. It's all of us, and our government should not be signing agreements in, in private that we don't get to say whether we like them or not. And that actually relates to some of the other questions that were asked. At a, at a certain point in this, this narrative of, how, of human beings and our rationality and our self-interest and what development means, at a certain point it got turned upside down. And rather than development or economic progress or whatever we want to call it being the master, um, we're now living in a world that, certainly for my students, um, my students tend to come into classes thinking that increasing foreign direct investment or increasing trade, that that's the master of development and that development will automatically happen. So these, these things that we want, again going back to my highly abstract, these good things, that are actually not we want, that the, the small scale farmers in El Salvador or or the Philippines, or we in this audience can agree on, that should be the master of development, um, not the other way around. And, and we've got, we, we're in this world where purposely the means have been confused with the ends and the means are actually wrong. Um, and um, just moving quickly to, to Greece, well, first of all, one of my pet peeves is I don't think we should call anything an emerging market or an emerging economy. These are not markets, these are not economies, these are countries with people. And then as soon as we call them markets or economies, it changes the way we think about them. They're, yeah, they're, they're not people. They're not people who live and die depending on what happens to that society and their, and their government. But um, what's happened in, in Greece is a horrific example as of many of Latin American countries in the last decade of the 1980s, of a horrific example of where economics is wrong. The IMF has actually now issued a public report that was an even more damning private report, where IMF co economists have said, whoops, we got austerity wrong. The, what's called the multiplier 
the, the um, economic implication of that austerity actually was much greater than we thought it was going to be. But we still live in this absurd world where people at the IMF or World Bank or the people who push the Green Revolution can say, oops, we got it wrong, and then there's no consequences. Oops, we got it wrong, but people on the ground in these countries are, are dying as a result of this and the environment. And we need some more moral authority that, that these institutions and these economists in these institutions have to take, have to, it's like reparations. You got it wrong, so you now resolve, not resolve it, but you make up for it and put people who actually know what they're talking about in charge of this. In Greece, in the case of Greece, it could have been solved with taxation rates. With taxation going up, that was really a key problem in Greece. I have a lot more to say, but let me stop there. I can hear what other people have to say. <laughs> I, well, I'm a strange fish, but uh, I will only reveal uh, one card here that captures some of what you can imagine would, would have been my responses if there was more time. Uh, I have uh, come to believe that sustainability, the idea of sustainability is getting in the way of doing the right thing. Because every time we invoke the future generations, we neglect, ignore, or even shove under the bus those who are living today who would not be alive tomorrow unless we do something for them. And that includes life expectancy, that includes infant mortality. All the children who would not be alive tomorrow is something that we do not take into account by invoking future generations. And it's a tough call. And uh, I'm not against the idea of catering to future generations. But the way it has been employed by environmentalists and ecological economics, if I may say so, has been politically counter to all the groups and all the people that I have collaborated with in uh, their desire to have better access to resources to make their life better than what was yesterday. Well, a couple of things about the discount rate. The discount rate is actually based on a natural phenomenon. Human beings, like all other species prefer the present uh, for very good reasons. It was highly adaptive uh, to prefer the present 50,000 years ago. However, the, the problem is the more miserable we make the future look, the more we prefer the present. So if people are convinced it's all over, they're going to go out and consume and binge and do all sorts of mean and nasty things. On the other hand, if we can create, and this is absolutely essential for anything, whether you call it sustainability or just survival, a vision of the future that is attractive and far more appealing than the vision that results from simply extending our current path, then people will start to value that future. Even discounting it to the present may, might make them val more, value it more than they do their present state of angst. So this whole idea, I, I spent a lot of time talking about of, of socially constructing an alternative vision for the future, which involves security, in an economic sense, which involves ecological stability, which involves social justice to address these kinds of issues. That can be an attractive vision toward which people will be willing to work if they can be convinced that it's going to protect their interests. And as I say, it will because this is a collective kind of problem. But this is a big story for the reasons that Josh mentioned. The Koch brothers, how many of you have heard of the Koch brothers? Okay, well, that's good. They're just one example of numerous families who are spending literally tens of millions of dollars every year to make sure that nothing we've talked about here gets out into the, re the real world. They're counter-constructing a reality, or at least they're constructing the current state, the status quo, so that it can't be budged from the rails. It will lead to the kind of, I think, implosion that, that we talked about, both socially and ecologically. I'm frankly getting to the point given precisely the story that Josh talked about, that no matter what we do as a, I suppose, an alternative movement in economics or environment or whatever, we do not have the resources to match those available on the other side. We need to, in some ways, okay, I'll get to the bottom line. I think civil insurrection is probably, I don't mean out-and-out -out riots with property damage and destruction, 
but thousands, millions of people marching in the streets, demanding their government start to pay more attention to their interests, is the only thing that's going to wake Washington and Ottawa up to the reality. They are purchased now. I've heard several people talk here about how governments are in the pockets of the corporate sector. As long as governments are in the pockets of the corporate sector and the population, eh, don't care. That's the way it's going to be. Politicians are acting naturally in defense of their current status and power. But if the people can show that they threaten that status and power by marching in the streets, that they will vote against policies that are against their interests, then maybe change is possible. So I've been a scientist all my life. I used to believe that new data led to better decisions. That never has happened in my whole career. It's been the greatest disappointment. And I've now realized that what really changes human behavior is acting in one's interests, and in this case, in our collective interests, in the political arena, in ways that force the vote to come in the directions that we want to go. So get out of the streets.